Professor, do you also concur that this bill now is safe? Yes, certainly. I'd have no reservations in saying that. I think the residual issues relate to certainly the possibility that there are still some buried drums there, although we've got clear evidence that the vast majority of drums were removed in two separate incidents. Any material which is in, was in those drums after 20 years, if it was a liquid, will have volatilised off or moved down, as Mick says. So there's a question mark in relation to groundwater, which is going to be pursued by CFA. In terms of the uh, firewater treatment system, obviously issues have been raised there recently and are being addressed by CFA, but there's nothing in my report which would lead me to conclude that there's any inappropriate or significant risk to people on the site at present. And what would you like to say to the people who claim they are now ill as a result of what's happened? Well, it's an open question, and the, the dilemma here is that the events are so far removed in time, and there are so many confounding variables in people's lives, that it's going to be difficult to draw firm cause and effects between exposure at Fiskville, other exposures which people may have in, had in their lives, and other factors. Uh, we're not dealing with a relatively straightforward situation as you are, for example, with asbestos, where there's a very clear causal pathway between exposure to a material and a consequent health outcome. Now, I'm not a medico, and that's why it's important that we move from here into the area where epidemiologists and medicos are involved. But it is a fraught area. It is going to be difficult to reach firm conclusions. And what, what sort of chemicals are we talking about? Well, the sorts of materials which came in in these drums, and remember there's no very limited documentary evidence after all this time, and because the materials were gifted, it was not the sort of thing which gave a rise to a whole paper, <coughs> paper trail. So we're going basically on what people remember, and basically what they remember is that the materials were various solvents, and solvents cover a vast range of potential materials, uh, paint used in outer spec, spec aviation fuels and things of this sort. So clearly there are materials which are potentially dangerous when handled, if you're breathing in the fumes over a long period, dangerous when burnt, if you're exposed over a long period to the uh, fine particles and various chemicals which may be absorbed onto those. But we simply don't know precisely what the materials would be, but we can infer from what we do know that certainly there were hazards associated, but those hazards were particularly concentrated on the limited number of people who were actually dealing with the raw chemicals, the people who set up the fire simulations on the uh, training area, and particularly to the full-time instructors who were exposed over an average period of about three and a half years, but some for much longer, to the products of combustion, to foam, and to recirculated firewater. You say that the facility was one of the last to uh, realise that these practices were dangerous, or at least them. It was 96, 99, you said. Why did it take so long for this investigation to happen? Well, I guess that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's come about because people have actually started to draw possible links between what they're now experiencing in terms of ill health and thinking back to what, they, what was happening at Fiskville, what they were exposed to there. Uh, I think that this is the sort of thing that often does emerge in that sort of way. But the main change, as I've said earlier, was a change in the 1990s it was a recognition which was unfortunately driven more by the grassroots than by management. And as I said before, management were slow to really take this up. But if the CFA knew that the materials were dangerous and every other training facility wasn't using them, why did it take so long? Why didn't the CFA look into it when they ceased the practices because they were dangerous? Well, I'm not sure that every other training system back in the 70s and the 80s wasn't using similar sorts of materials. But they had stopped using them. Well, I'm not aware of that. The investigation which we've done only explored to a limited degree what was going on interstate. But what I have concluded is that by the late 80s or early 90s, people interstate were starting to become concerned about this. And at a similar time, people down on the grassroots at Fiskville and in the dangerous goods area of human resources were also becoming alert to it. The problem is that senior management was slow to do this. Can I make the last couple of questions, please? Unless that was the last one. <laughs> okay.